In fact, I joined the IFRC just three months ago, but before that, uh, I had an opportunity to work for 25 years in development humanitarian setting, and during that time, interacting almost daily in the field with volunteers uh, of the Red Cross and Red Crescent, with different national societies, you know, in responding, you know, to the needs of people. What do you gain from that? A lot of admiration, a lot of respect and also an appreciation of you know, a true expression of humanity to support those in need. Uh, being inside, then you discover further those values that are driving our volunteers on the front line in the most difficult circumstances, you know, doing good. You also see uh, wonderful stuff attracted by this mission, you know, doing the work, and also the diversity of 189 national societies complementing each other and then responding in you know, two different types of crises. So it's a true privilege to be part of that movement. And my first three months you know, at the head of the Secretariat you know, is a you know, true motivation to continue working in that same direction and then deserve the privilege we have to be part of it. Yeah, my priorities will be pretty much uh, uh, driven from the work and the priorities by its, the membership of the Federation. Being a membership organization composed of uh, 180 nation, uh, 89 national societies, our only uh, pertinent priorities you know, will be building on what is happening and what the membership is doing so that we are in a better position to bring them together uh, convene them to learn from each other, to support each other, and to, to address issues of common concern, not only at the local and national level, but the global level, and then uh, have a great impact in that. And um, the visit that I had here in Spain you know, comforted me even further in that direction, to see a national society which is grounded in its local realities, responding to the needs of the elderly, you know, the sick, you know, those in need, so the vulnerable people and the needs of support, you know, the young people, as well as, you know, marginalized groups such as migrants. And, and by so doing, uh, expressing, you know, the shared humanity in responding to the needs of everybody. And uh, the motto of uh, the uh, organization that says, cada dia más cerca de las personas, is really what it is about. We need to accompany the people and communities you know, to respond to their challenges. And that's where we get our relevance, that's where we get our legitimacy. And that legitimate base then will allow us now to work regionally and internationally. So during my stay, again, I had an opportunity to meet with uh, Spanish delegates coming from Sierra Leone, and not only in the capital city of Sierra Leone, but from Kenema, which is uh, the epicenter of the Ebola crisis. And then they were there at a time where nobody was there. They were there at a time when uh, there was more fear, more stigma, more discrimination, more exclusion. But again, armed by the value of shared humanity, armed by the value of serving the person in need, armed by the value of whatever is happening in part of the world that is impacting on you know, our common humanity is also impacting on us. You know, they did this uh, uh, pioneering work and um, let me use this opportunity to really thank them for doing that. Also uh, commend them you know, for the pioneering role and then showing the way as a member of our federation of what we're really about. Now, to come back to your question, you know, against the background, you know, my priorities then will be to bring that force of the membership together and to work for them, to work through them, and organize ourselves in a manner that when we face challenges such as big disasters that we collectively respond in an effective manner. So we uh, should also bear in mind that uh, natural hazards do not always have to turn into disasters. If we prepare ourselves, if we equip our, the communities to respond to the shocks, and in the aftermath of those acute phases, we do the recovery well, in a concept now we are all using, meaning the concept of resilience. So it's a, I really look forward to working with all the membership. And again, what I'm seeing here, you know, comfort me, you know, one more time 
you know, in our collective force of complementing each other in that regard. Uh, the world is not short of crises nowadays. So the um, conflicts, you know, are getting more and more protracted, meaning they are, they are taking much more time, you know, to be resolved. We are seeing the natural disasters happening also more and more. Economic crises are hitting hard, you know, on people, and vulnerabilities are being exacerbated, you know, further. And that creates a lot of gaps and disparities, disparities that we can see not only between countries, but within countries, within countries between the rich and the poor, between men and women, between the young and the old, between those living in the rural areas as well as in the urban settings. Those are all challenges, you know, that we face. And I think the magnitude of the challenges is no way a reason for demotivation. In the contrary, you know, that is what is uh, pushing us further, what is motivating us further to go to scale and then respond to an appropriate level. But the whole problems and then its solutions cannot be on our own shoulders alone. Many of those uh, problems will find their long-term solutions in the political resolutions of some of the conflicts, because if we continue to see the multiplicity and the complexity of the crisis the way we see it, the uh, scale of our response may not match the magnitude you know, of the problems. And I think we need to join forces, all of us, you know, that politicians play their roles, other actors play their roles, so that we have societies that are more stable and there are more peace in the world, so that we can focus more on the needs of the most marginalized and hardest to reach, and then make a difference in the long term. But I think in despite all those challenges, you know, what we do, even if we do not solve the problems completely, our contribution is restoring more and more dignity of people, making them worth you know, living, and by so doing also uh, planting the seeds for a better society, a society of solidarity, mutual support, and hope. main assets of the IFRC is membership, first of all. And by membership, we mean the 189 national societies across the world, and that is a unique force. And then if we dig deeper, it means 17 million volunteers you know, around the world that are living, working in the communities. So when there is a problem, the IFRC and the Red Cross, Red Crescent, they usually do not need to go into communities because we're already there. You know, after a crisis, we do not go out because that's where we stay anyway. This is a formidable asset, you know, that uh, it is very rare to see uh, somewhere else. And we need to build, you know, on that asset. The other challenge is then would be how do we organize that, you know, so that we sustain that number of 17 million, but also even we grow it. You know, by uh, in, in, uh, uh, motivating the next generation, you know, to join, by also looking at you know the uh, kind of unbalances that we see in our demographics, you know, in a number of countries we see you know more and more aging population, and then less young people. In other places, it is the other way around. How can we address those uh, unbalances, and then uh, look at you know volunteering in different ways? It is not only the young, but it is also the experienced, you know, and the old, you know, and those who are ready to give back, you know, to society what they have received, you know, before. It's about maintaining the chain of solidarity between this generation and the next one. That is going to be very critical, and that is an excellent and formidable asset for the IFRC as a whole. Being part of also a movement that includes the ICRC is another asset. So ICRC will lead in uh, conflict situations while we lead you know, in disaster management and natural disasters. So that complementarity of roles and then bringing together the force of the movement, it is something also which is quite unique and that we need to build on by recognizing it as in its uh, true value. So challenges, of course, coordination is always a challenge. You know, we need to uh, manage uh, all the threats that goes with it. You know, threats for competition, for example, competition for resources, competition for visibility, competition for egos. We are human beings. Unless we are aware of that, we will not be able to manage it. But what is at stake is much bigger than any of us. 
And at the end of the day, we will fall back to what really matters most, which is our shared humanity and our motivation and desire to support our communities, you know, to improve their quality of life and restore their dignity. This is the first time that we're having a crisis of Ebola at this scale. We used to see Ebola at a rural level, you know, small scale that could be quarantined, handled, you know, in a number of weeks and months and over. This first time it is getting urban. It is getting also at a multi-country level, and um, and that is making what is making now this outbreak a very very special. Now, in such a context, you know, the contacts of people will be multiplied. And those contacts also will be contributing to the propagation of the, uh, of the virus. Hence, the rapid pro propagation of over 4,000 cases now and you know, of almost 2,000 people who died. Now, as I said before, the Red Cross is always there all the time. Now, we are the first to inform the population of what it is about, help them also to take the appropriate behaviors and attitudes that will protect them and protect their loved ones help them to mitigate fear. But this is because it is new, the misunderstanding and the fear has been so big. And communities do not always understand that we convince them, you know, to entrust us with their loved ones, to take them for treatment, to take them for isolation. But in 95% of the cases, we will not bring them back because they will die. They will not also understand that, you know, these people cannot be buried the way they used to bury them. So then they will understand that they cannot grieve and mourn the, youth, the way they used to be. And what we call uh, improperly dead body management, it is not what we do at the Red Cross. We don't manage dead bodies. We uh, respectfully and in a dignified manner treat deceased people and then accompany them to their last place of, uh, last place of rest. And this is very critical to show that our humanity is not stopping now with the end of life. It continues also beyond then and then keeping you know that chain between those who are here and those who have left us and i think you know being the glue and then uh, that in that chain is something very critical and that is the most important thing i believe that we do in addition to that and uh, in continuation to that of course we are building treatment centers like the one we had in kenema and then we had uh, spanish delegates you know working in uh, we will continue to do the contact tracing we will uh, uh, continue to uh, expand those kind of activities in other countries, such as in Guinea and uh, in uh, Liberia. But around those countries, you know, there are nine other countries where we work in advance, you know, to do prevention, to prepare the ground so that we do not have, you know, the propagation that we are seeing. So we hope with all those efforts and then the support of the international community and the coming in of uh, new actors, we will be able, like everybody hope, to contain this outbreak in the coming months.